Hello, I'm James Morell and I will be performing a monologue from Philip Ridley's The Pitchfork Disney. I'll be playing the character of Presley. Fun fact, I auditioned at drama schools with this speech. Second fun fact, at my art set audition, I was actually sat right next to Philip Ridley before I went in for my audition, but because of my lack of research or my lack of attention in terms of anywhere past this space, um, I didn't realise it was him until I went into the audition room and I introduced myself and said that these were the speeches I was doing. And when I mentioned the Philip Ridley speech, they were like, he's outside. He's doing a two week intensive writing course with the second or third years. Do you want us to get him in? See if he wants to sit and watch. And I was like, yeah, that's a great opportunity. But as they went out to grab him, he was like already at the end of the corridor and it was a long corridor. So we all decided that it'd be in all of our best interests if we just got the audition over with. Um... I got a recall from Artset actually, but then I got rejection, which is normal. You know, it wasn't my time and I accepted that pretty, pretty quickly, actually. Um, I'm quite good, good with rejection because I know it's a part of life and you can't get hung up on rejection because it doesn't necessarily mean you're not good enough. It just means you're not right for that part or that place, you know, at that time. But your time will come and there are many parts that are made for you. And you will do it if you just keep working hard. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm actually gonna go into a career change and push for motivational speaking. I will be, my first speech will be, uh, I don't know how long I'm gonna carry this on. I just procrastinate before I even go to speak. Anyway, let's do the speech. Let's just get this. Flat, flat, still not flat. I saved my pocket money for three weeks. I didn't buy anything. No comics, no crisps, no sweets. I went to a pet shop and I bought a little green snake instead. A grass snake, they called it. And when I got home, I played with the snake. It felt warm and soft. I was scared, but I still had to hold it. <laughs> I liked the way it wrapped itself around my fingers like an electric shoelace. Then I realised I could never keep it, not as a pet. Where would it sleep? What would it eat? Where would it go when I went to school? So I had to get rid of it. But how? All sorts of things occurred to me. I could flush it down the toilet, uh, bury it. I could throw it from a tower block. All the while, another thought was taking place. A thought so terrible that it seemed the only thing to do. So I got a frying pan and I stuck it on the gas stove. I dropped some butter in the pan and I turned the gas up full and the fat started to crackle and smoke. I dropped the snake into the pan and it span round and round. Its skin burst open like the skin of a sausage. It took ages to die. Its tiny mouth opened and closed. Its black eyes exploded. Oh, it was a wonderful thing to watch. <laughs> All that burning, scolding and peeling. I got a fork and I stuck the prongs into its skin. <laughs> Boiling black blood bubbled from the holes and when the snake was dead, I put it on a plate. I cut the snake into bite-sized little pieces and then I tasted it. Like greasy chicken. I ate it all and then I licked the plate afterwards and when my mum got home she'd saw I'd been cooking and she hit me. She saw the scorched patch on the frying pan and she said we're gonna have to buy a new one now. But she never did. <laughs>